Good morning, lovely people. We are back for more of the autobiography of Malcolm X. This is my third reading, part three. Um, let me see, the last time we read... Doo -doo 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 -doo. So, um, Malcolm had been taken from home. His father had been killed. Um, his mother was starting to sort of talk to herself and lose it. And the welfare agency kept coming back and harassing her and um, trying to take her children. So they took Malcolm and he's going to live with a family. Okay. When I finally was sent to the Johannes home, to the Gohannes' home, at least in a surface way, I was glad. I remember that when I left home with the state man, my mother said one thing, don't let him them feed him any pig. I'm realizing I read this at the last part, but I'm just going to read it again because here we are. It was better in a lot of ways at the Gohannes's. Big Boy and I shared his room together, and we hit it off nicely. He just wasn't the same as my blood brothers. The Johannes's, the Gohannes's were very religious people. Big Boy and I attended church with them. They were sanctified holy rollers now. The preachers and congregations jumped even higher and shouted even louder than the Baptists that I'd known. They sang at the top of their lungs and swayed back and forth and cried and moaned and beat on tambourines and chanted. It was spooky, with ghosts and spirituals and haunts, seeming to be in the very atmosphere when finally we came out of the church going back home. The Gohannises and Mrs. Addock loved to go fishing, and some Saturdays Big Boy and I would go along. I changed schools now to Lansing's West Junior High School. It was right in the heart of the Negro community, and a few white kids were there, but Big Boy and I didn't mix much with any of our schoolmates. Big Boy didn't mix much with any of our schoolmates, and neither did I. And when we were fishing, neither he nor I liked the idea of just sitting and waiting around for the fish to jerk the cord under the water or make the line tight and quiver. I figured there should be some smarter way to get the fish, though we never discovered what that may, way might be. Mr. Gohannis was close cronies with some other men who some Saturdays would take me and Big Boy with them hunting rabbits. I would had my father's twenty-two caliber rifle. My mother had said it was all right for me to take it with me. The old men had a set rabbit hunting strategy that they always used. Usually, when a dog jumps a rabbit, the rabbit gets away, and that same rabbit will run somehow instinctively in a circle and return sooner or later past the very spot that he was originally jumped. Well, when the old men would just sit and wait there in hiding somewhere for the rabbit to come back, then, their shot, then they got their shots in at him. I got to thinking about it, and finally I thought of a plan. I would separate from them and Big Boy, and I would go to a point where I figured the rabbit returning would have to pass me first. It worked like magic. I began to get those three or four rabbits before they got one of them. The astonishing thing was that none of the old men could figure out why. <laughs> they outdid themselves exclaiming that a sh what a sure shot I was. I was about 12 then. All I had done was to improve on their strategy. And it was beginning. It was the beginning of a very important life lesson for me. That any time you find someone more successful than you are, especially when you're both engaged in the same business, you know they're doing something that you aren't. I would return home to visit fairly often. Sometimes Big Boy, or another, or both of the Gohannises would go with me, and sometimes not. I would be glad when some of them did go because it made the ordeal easier. Soon, the state people were making plans to take over all of my mother's children. She talked to herself nearly all the time now, and there was a crowd of new white people entering the picture, always asking questions. They would even visit me at the Gohannises. They would ask me questions out on the porch or sitting out in their cars. Eventually, my mother suffered a complete breakdown, and the court orders were finally signed. They took her to the state mental hospital at Kalamazoo. It was 70 some miles from Lansing, about an hour and a half on the bus. A Judge McClellan 
in Lansing had the authority over me and all of my brothers and sisters. We were state children now. Court wards. He had full say-so over us. A white man in charge of a black man's children. Nothing but legal modern slavery, however, however kindly intentioned. My mother remained in the same hospital at Kalamazoo for about 26 years. Later, when I was still growing up in Michigan, I would go to visit her ever so often. Nothing I can imagine could have moved me as deeply as seeing her pitiful state. In 1963, we got my mother out of the hospital, and she now lives there in Lansing with Phil Burton and his family. It was so much worse than if it had been a physical sickness for which a cause might be known. Medicine given, a care affected. Every time I visited her, when finally they led her a case, I'm sorry, every time I visited her, when finally they led her a case, a number, back inside where we had been sitting together, from where we had been sitting together, I felt worse. My last visit, when I knew I'd never come back to see her there, was in 1952. I was 27. My brother Philbert had told me that on his last visit, he had recognized something in her, like in spots she started to recognize. So it's hard not to use this as a mirror sometimes. Stretchy, our incredible shrinking stretchy hair, y'all. Okay. In spots, where was I at? But she, okay, I read this wrong, so I'm going to reread it. My brother Philbert had told me that on his last visit, she had recognized him somewhat in spots, he said. But she didn't recognize me at all. She stared at me. She didn't know who I was. Her mind, when I tried to talk to reach her, was somewhere else. I asked, Mama, do you know what day it is? She said, staring, all the people have gone. All the people have gone. I can't describe how I felt. The woman who had brought me into this world and nursed me and advised me and chastised me and loved me didn't even know me. It was as if I was trying to walk up the si a side of a hill of feathers. I looked at her. I listened to her. But there was nothing that I could do. I truly believe that if ever a state social agency destroyed a family, it destroyed ours. We wanted and tried to stay together. Our home didn't have to be destroyed, but the welfare, the courts, their doctors gave us the one, two, three punch, and ours was the only case of its kind, and ours wasn't the only case of its kind. <clears throat> the act of stealing children, right? And is that happening today? Is that happening today in 2000? 20, um, October 2020, you know, is the state and other agencies and situations still in children from homes? I wonder. I knew I wouldn't be back to see my mother again because it could make me very vicious and dangerous knowing how they had locked us. Mm, I'm sorry. I knew I wouldn't be back to see my mother again because it could make me a very vicious and dangerous person, knowing that how they had looked at us as numbers and as a case in their book, not as human beings. And knowing that my mother in there was a statistic that didn't have to be, that existed because of a society's failure, hypocrisy, greed, and lack of mercy and compassion. Hence, I have no mercy and compassion in me for a society that will crush people, then penalize them for not being able to stand up under the weight. I have rarely talked to anyone about my mother, for I believe that I am capable of killing a person without hesitation who happened to make the wrong kind of remark about my mother. So I purposely don't make any opening for, for some fool to step into. Back then, when our family was destroyed in 1937, Wilfred and Hilda were old enough so that the state let them stay on on their own at our big four-bedroom house that my father had built. Philbert was placed with another family in Lansing, and Mrs. Hackett, a Mrs. Hackett, while Reginald and Wesley went to live with a family called Williams, who were friends of my mother's. And Yvonne and Robert went to live with a West Indian family named McGuire. 
Separated though we were, all of us maintained fairly close touch around Lansing, in school and out. Whenever we could get together, despite the artificially created separation and distance between us, we remained very close in our feelings toward one another. Chapter 2, Mascot. On June 27th that year, 1937, Joe Lewis knocked out James J. Braddock to become the heavyweight champion of the world. And all the Negroes in Lansing, like Negroes everywhere, went wildly happy with the greatest celebration of race pride our generation had ever known. I'm pretty sure that Maya Angelou talks about this same fight in her book, um, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. So if you've been listening, you might remember that instance when everybody was crowded around the radio listening. So, I don't know. I, I like that in these three books that there are these threads of um, similarity and understanding and like a thread of history, American history. Every Negro boy old enough <clears throat> to walk wanted to be the first next brown bomber. My brother Philbert, who had already become a pretty good boxer in school, was no exception. I was trying to play basketball. I was gangly and tall, but I wasn't very good at it. Too awkward. In the fall of that year, Philbert entered the amateur bouts that were held in Lansing's Prudent Arboretum. He did well, surviving the increasingly tough eliminations. I would go down to the gym and watch him train. It was very exciting. Perhaps without realizing it, I became secretly envious for one thing. I know I could not help seeing some of my younger I know I could not help seeing some of my young younger brother Reginald's lifelong aberration for me, getting siphoned on to Philbert instead. That's really cute, right? Like he really enjoyed that his brother looked up to him. So much so that he's envious that his brother is changing. Um admiration. So anyway. That's, I think that's a cute sentiment. People praise Philbert as a natural boxer. I figured that since we belong to the same family, maybe I could become one too. So I put myself in the ring. I think I was about 13 when I signed up for my first bout, but my height and raw bone frame, frame let me get away with claiming that I was 16, the minimum age, and my weight of about 128 pounds got me classified as a bantam weight. They matched me with a white boy, a novice like myself named Phil Peterson, named Bill Peterson. I'll never forget him. When our turn, when our turn in the next amateur bouts came up, all of my brothers and sisters were there watching, along with just about everyone else I knew in town. They were there not so much because of me, but because of Philbert, who had begun to build up a pretty good following, and they wanted to see how his brother would do. I walked down the aisle between the people thronging rows of seats and climbed in the ring. Bill Peterson and I were introduced, and then the referee called us together and mumbled all of that stuff about fighting fair and breaking clean. Then the bell rang, and we came out of our corners. I knew I was scared, but I didn't know, as Bill Peterson told me later on, that he was scared of me too. He was so scared I was going to hurt him that he knocked me down 50 times if he had done it once. <clears throat> He did such a job on my reputation in the Negro neighborhood that I practically went into hiding. A Negro just can't be whipped by somebody white and return with his head up to the neighborhood. Especially in those when sports and to a lesser extent show business were the only fields open to Negroes and where the ring was the only place a Negro could whip a white man and not be lynched. When I did show my face again, the Negroes I knew rolled me so badly that I knew I had to do something. Let's see if we can fix this uh, camera a little bit. But worst off of my humiliations was my younger brother Reginald's attitude. He simply never mentioned the fight. It was the way he looked at me and avoided looking at me that hurt. So I went back to the gym and I trained hard. I beat bags and skipped ropes and grunted and sweated all over the place. And finally, I signed up to fight Bill Peterson again. This time, the bouts were held in his hometown of Alma, Michigan. The only thing better about the rematch was that hardly anyone I knew was there to see it. I was particularly grateful for Reginald's absence. The moment
moment the bell rang, I saw a fist and then the canvas coming up. And 10 seconds later, the referee was saying 10 over me. It was probably the shortest fight in history. I lay there listening to the full count, but I couldn't move. To tell the truth, I'm not sure I wanted to move. That white blood was beginning, the beginning and the end of my fighting career. A lot of times in these later years since I became a Muslim, I thought back to that fight and reflected that it was Allah's work to stop me. I might have wound up to be a punchy. Not long after this, I came into the classroom with my hat on. I did it deliberately. The teacher who was white ordered me to keep that hat on and go on and walk around the room until he told me to stop. That way, he said, everyone can see you. Meanwhile, we'll go on with class for those of us who are here to learn something. <clears throat> I was still walking around the room when he got up from his desk and turned his back to us to write something on the blackboard. Everyone in the classroom was looking when at this moment, he passed behind his desk, snatched up a, thumb, a thumbtack and deposited it in his chair. When he returned to sit back down, I was far from the scene of the crime circling around the rear of the room still. Then he hit the tack and I heard him holler and I caught a glimpse of him sprawling up as I disappeared through the door. With my deportment record, I wasn't really shocked when the decision came that I had been expelled. I guess I must have had some vague idea that I didn't have to go to school. I'd be allowed to stay on with the Gohannises and wander around town or maybe get a job if I wanted one for a little pocket money. But I got rocked on my heels when the state man whom I hadn't seen before came and got me at the Gohannises and took me down to the court. They told me I was going to a reform school. I was still 13 years old. But first, I was going to the detention home. It was in Mason, Michigan, about 12 miles from Lansing. The detention home was where all the bad boys and girls from Ingham County were held on their way to reform school, waiting for their hearings. The white state man was a Mr. Maynard Allen. He was nicer to me than most of the white welfare people had been. He even had consoling words for the Gohannises and Mrs. Adock and Big Boy. All of them were crying, but I wasn't. With a few clothes, the few clothes that I owned stuffed in a box, we rode in his car to Mason. He talked as he drove along, saying that my school marks showed that if I would just straighten up, I could make something of myself. He said that reform school had the wrong reputation. He talked about that word reform and what it meant to change and to become better. He said the school was really a place where boys like me could have time to see their mistakes and start a new life and become somebody everybody wanted to be proud of. And he told me that the lady in charge of the detention home and Mrs. Swirlin and her husband were very good people. They were good people. Mrs. Swirlin was bigger than her husband. I remember a big, boxing, robust, laughing woman. And Mr. Swirlin was thin with black hair and a mustache and a red face, quiet and polite, even to me. They liked me right away, too. Mrs. Swirlin showed me to my room, my own room, first in my life. It was in one of those huge dormitory-like buildings where kids in detention were kept in those days, and still are in most places. I discovered next with surprise that I was allowed to eat with the Swirlins. It was the first time I'd eaten with white people, at least with grown white people, since the Seventh Day at Venice Country Meetings. It wasn't my own exclusive it wasn't my own exclusive privilege, of course, except for with the very troublesome boys and girls at the detention home who were kept locked up, those who had run away and had been caught and brought back, or something like that. All of us ate with the Swirlins, sitting at the head of the long tables. They had a white cook helper, I recall, Lucille Lathrop. It amazes me how these names come back from a time that I haven't thought about for more than 20 years. Lucille treated me well, too. Her husband's name was Dwayne Lathrop. He worked somewhere else, but he stayed there at the detention home on the weekends with Lucille. I noticed again how white people smelled different from us and how their food tasted different, not seasoned like Negro cooking. I began to sweep and mop and dust around the Swirlin's home, as, as I had done with Big Boy around the Gohannis' home. <clears throat> they all liked my attitude. 
and it was out of their liking for me that I soon became accepted by them as a mascot. I know now. They would talk about anything and everything with me standing right there hearing them, the same way people would talk freely in front of a pet parrot or dog. They wouldn't even talk about me. I'm, I'm sorry. They would even talk about me or about Miggers. Remember, I use M instead of N. That's just my way of getting um, the entire book read here online. They would even talk about me. And they used the word Migger. I suppose that in their own minds, they meant no harm. In fact, they probably meant well. It was the same with the cook, Lucille, and her husband, Dwayne. I remember one day, Mr. Swirling, as nice as he was, came in from Lansing, where he had been through the Negro section, and said to Mrs. Swirling, right in front of me, I just can't see how those Miggers can be so happy and so poor. He talked about how they lived in shacks, but had those big shining cars out front. And Mrs. Swirling said, with me standing right there, Miggers are just that way. The scene always stayed with me. It was the same with other white people, most of them local politicians, when they would come visiting the Swirlings. One of their favorite parlor topics was Miggers. One of them was the judge who was in charge of me in Lansing. He was a close friend to the Swirlings. He would talk about me when he came, and they would call me in, and he would look me up and down, and his expressions were approving, like he was examining a fine colt or a pedigree pup. I knew they must have told him how I acted and how I worked. I think it's interesting, right? So this is just a question for you. When you get together with your close friends, you know, in private conversations, what do you talk about? Right? Are you, are you consumed with some other population of people? Do you talk about that? Talk about yourself? Talk about other people? I don't know. What's your answer? What I am trying to say is that it never dawned upon them that I could understand that I wasn't a pet but a human being. They didn't give me credit for having the same sensitivity, intellect, and understanding that they would have been ready and willing to recognize in a white boy in my position. But it has historically been the case with white people in their regard for black people that even though we might be with them, we aren't considered of them. Even though they appeared to have opened the door, it was still closed. Thus, they never did really see me. This was the short, this was the sort of kindly condens. This was the sort of kindly condensation, which I try to clarify today to these integration hungry Negroes about their liberal white friends, these so-called good white people, most of them anyway. I don't care how nice one is to you thing you must always remember is that almost never does he really see you as he sees himself, as he sees his own kind. He may stand with you through thin, but not through thick. When the chips are down, you'll find that as fixed in him as bone is to his structure, is sometimes his subconscious conviction that he's better than anybody black. But I was no more vaguely aware of anything like that in my detention home years. I did my little chores around the house and everything was fine. And each weekend, they didn't mind my catching a ride over the Lansing for the afternoon or evening. If I wasn't old enough, I sure was big enough by then and nobody ever questioned my hanging out, even at night in the streets of the Negro section. I was growing up to be even bigger than Wilfred and Filbert, who had begun to meet girls at the school dances and other places and introduce me to a few. But the ones who seemed to like me, I didn't go for and vice versa. I couldn't dance a lick anyway, and I couldn't see squandering my few dimes on a girl. So mostly I pleasured myself these Saturday nights by gawking around the Negro bars and restaurants. Reminds me of uh, Richard Wright. The jukeboxes were Whalen, Erkstein Hawkins, Tuxedo Junction, and Slim Slams, Flat Foot Flugie, things like that. Sometimes big bands from New York out touring one night stands in the sticks would play for the big dances in Lansing. Everybody with legs would come out to see the performer who bore the magic name New York in his title, which is how I first heard of Lucky Thompson and Milt Jackson, both of whom I later got to know well in Harlem. 
All right, we're going to stop right there, friends. Thank you for joining me. And we will see you for part number four when we do. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed. Be your best. Chill. Take it easy during the pandemic.